super excited for today, super excited for what God is doing. Uh, and uh, we are in between series right now. Uh, and so we've been able to have some guest speakers come in. I don't know how many of you guys were here for last week's message from Pastor Chris. Absolutely amazing. Please go back and watch it. And then super, super excited for Abraham Cho. In fact, when Phil told me that uh, Abraham Cho was going to come, I was like, what? Are you serious? So uh, to, you know, people who maybe are in the church planting world, that might not be a big deal. For those of us who are, we're super excited. And I know that uh, he is going to bring something that will uh, absolutely bless you. So make sure you grab about 100 other people and bring them next Sunday. Um, and, uh, and make sure you come because this is going to be super, super exciting. Um, also, just to kind of uh, kick today off, uh, I want to say this is that last week something very special happened. We're super excited about it, and maybe you did not get a chance, but Pastor Phil is standing in the back, and it was his birthday last week. <laughs> And so we just want to say we love you, Pastor Phil. We want to say we appreciate you. We're so grateful for you and happy birthday. Happy birthday. And look at him looking so young and everything. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, we are in the middle, like I said, of kind of a break between series, and we actually have something coming up, rolling up in September that we're super excited for, um, and we are going to be launching a whole new theme that's actually going to take us throughout the, through about nine months, and uh, man, we are excited for this. You guys are going to see some stuff coming, and our first sort of series, just to give you guys a little taste of what's coming, is from uh, what we're calling Origins, and it's going to be incredible. Basically, we want you guys to be able to see the whole story of who God is, to know his story, and to know where you are in that story, and to be able to tell that story. And so we are super excited uh, because we're going to look back and we're going to start with Genesis and see uh, what it is that God was up to and uh, his plan and our part, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. We're super excited for it, and you're going to see some new signs coming. You're going to see all sorts of stuff that is happening as we begin something that is very exciting for Inspired Church and a direction that the Lord has really been uh, putting on Pastor, not just Pastor Phil's heart, uh, but the whole staff, all the elders, and uh, we are excited for what is in the future of Inspire uh, because we love Inspire, we're excited for what Inspire is doing, and most importantly, we're excited for what Jesus Christ is doing through Inspire as we become a community that lives in gospel-centered rhythms of life, uh, and we're very, very, very um, prayerful for what the Lord is doing, and I cannot wait. And I, so I know that once you guys start seeing these things, you're going to get excited too. But again, um, we're going to really be looking at Genesis. And so you, for those of you who love to be people that kind of catch up or kind of see what's ahead, have you ever been to like a conference and they have like the whole agenda and you like look through the whole agenda first or like they like maybe you're in class and they pass you like the notes of what's going to happen today and you like look through them all ahead because you just kind of want to know in advance. If that's you, then just read through the book of Genesis before we begin and that way you can get a head start. But this is going to be super exciting. All right, guys. So we are, uh, doing a message this morning that I really felt as I was thinking about we're having communion and I thought, you know what, what if we did a message on communion? What if we did a message on communion? It kind of makes sense. We're going to take communion. So what if we actually did a message on communion? And so this morning I want to talk to you about the messy meal, the messy meal. The messy meal. Um, how many of you guys remember, maybe there are some of you here that remember rotary phones, right, or landlines. So rotary phones is you dial and you have to like do the circular, circular motion or landlines. I'm sure some of you all remember landlines still. And so there's like a cord that's attached to the phone that goes into your wall, you know. Um, and, you know, there's some great things about that. There was some awesome stuff that happened with landlines. And then we also got cell phones and then we went to cell phones. And here's the interesting thing is there are certain things that you can do on a cell phone that you cannot do on a landline. Certain things you can do on a cell phone. Like, for instance, butt dial. 
You cannot butt dial on a landline. In other words, butt dial is like make an accidental call, right? Have you ever had like your phone in your pocket and you accidentally called somebody? That ever happened to you, right? And the other person's listening. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you're like me where you will listen more intensely to a butt dial, an accidental phone call than you will to an actual phone call, right? Is that you? Like you're listening, you're trying to feel that. That's me. I am like trying to figure out what are they saying? Are they fighting? Are they going back and forth? Are they saying my name? What's happening? Like I, Becca is so different. She is so polite. She hangs up right away. She texts him. She says, hey, just so you know, you're accidentally calling me and I can hear what you're saying. I'm not. I will stay on the phone for 30 minutes. I will hear the conversation. I want to know what is going on through all the muffled noise, you know? Um, also, remember this, this is so crazy, is that uh, with minutes, you get minutes on cell phone. I don't know if you guys remember. Anybody remember minutes or rollover? Do y'all remember that? Right? And so, you know, what happened uh, for those younger folks is uh, you would get like, you know, I don't know, 100 minutes in a month or something that you can use to talk. And then this thing called rollover happened where if you didn't use all 100, whatever you didn't use would roll over into the next month and it would kind of accumulate, um, which is awesome. But then they even got crazier and now they started this thing called unlimited unlimited. And at first it was just a couple companies doing unlimited and then everybody had to do unlimited, unlimited minutes, unlimited. I don't know about you, but when I see the word unlimited or unconditional, there's something that is a little bit skeptical that comes up in me. I'm not sure, like, when I, when I see that, hey, this is going to be unlimited coverage or an unconditional guarantee, I'm like, oh, what does that mean? What does that mean? In fact, Kat and I were working on something. Mostly Kat was working on it, and she was talking to this company. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, well, she was. She was Anyway, and so, and this company's like, oh, well, we have this guarantee. And I was like, well, Kat, ask them what exactly. Like, like I want to know exactly everything that covers, because I want to know. Because it, it is true, like this lifetime guarantee, unconditional, unlimited guarantee. It gets us a little bit nervous, and I wonder if we bring those same kind of conversations into our relationship with God. When we hear about God's unlimited love, right? Unlimited forgiveness or unconditional love. Do we say, I think some of us might be like, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Like, are there loopholes? Are there certain things I can do to where now, okay, now I don't have that unconditional love? What exactly does that mean? And if you have anything like that, I'm excited that you're here today because we are going to uh, really be talking about the unconditional love, the unlimited forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at it through this thing called communion or this messy meal. The messy meal. And as we go through the messy meal, I really want to talk about three things. One is the context of the messy meal. The second is the chronology of the messy meal. And the third is the covenant of the messy meal. So the context, the chronology, and the covenant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, God, because we have come gathered together, Lord God, not so we could check something off of a list of things to do, but Lord, that we may sit under your word, that we may worship you, that we may gather with brothers and sisters, so that way you, Holy Spirit, we will give you permission to continue to shape us and mold us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. amen. The context, the context of this messy meal. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, and he was there with his disciples, and, and he was heading into Jerusalem, and Passover is a big deal. Passover was a big deal because it was this huge celebration where, uh, where they would all come together um, to celebrate when uh, Israel was in bondage in Egypt. You guys remember that? And so they were slaves in Egypt, and, and God was going to set 
set them free. And so if you remember, he came and there were the plagues of Egypt and, and, and the last plague was the death angel. Remember that? And, and so the death angel was going to come and was going to kill the firstborn in every household. And so what God's people were instructed to do was to take a lamb. Everybody say lamb. Take a lamb. Yeah, I need you guys to wake up a little bit. Take a lamb and, 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 and sacrifice it and take the blood and, and put it on the doorposts, right? And so when the death angel came through Egypt, uh, and as the death angel was taking the life of every firstborn son, if the death angel saw blood, lamb's blood on the doorpost, the death angel would pass over that house because he, because he knew that death had already been there. So death angel would pass over. So they called it the Passover celebration. And this is how Egypt was freed because Pharaoh finally said, okay, go. And, and, and so they did. And they were free because of that. And so this was a huge thing. So I want you to understand now, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years later, they, the, the, they're still celebrating this Passover meal. And so in Jerusalem, thousands and thousands of Jewish pilgrims are coming in from all over the place. And Jerusalem is packed. The roads are packed. All the hotels are full. It is absolutely packed. And the chief priests and the Pharisees, they heard that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And they were thinking, that this is a great opportunity for them to be able to snag Jesus, an opportunity that they've been waiting for because they want to arrest him if they can find him. Problem is it's busy, it's packed. So what they do is they come up with this plan and they want, to, and they want everybody to be on the look for Jesus. Look what John eleven fifty seven 57 says. It says this, the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they may arrest him. Wow. Now, for the bulk of today's uh, message, we are going to be looking at Luke chapter 22. Um, and so that's where we're going to get most of the information. But with that being said, we're actually going to be looking at several passages of scripture today. So here they said, listen, be on the lookout. If you find him, if you see him, report it. But there was a caveat. Because yes, they wanted to arrest Jesus, but they wanted to make sure uh, that they did it correctly because they were smart. And so in Mark 14, 2, it says this, but not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to send people out to find Jesus. And once they found Jesus, they wanted people to just keep an eye on where he was throughout the festival because they wanted to make their move, but not during the festival because they knew that if they did that, it would cause a riot because Jesus was popular. Jesus was popular. And so they said, let's do it after the festival, after Passover. Everyone's going to go back to their hometowns. They're going to go back home. And then we can make the move. And we're going to arrest him. We're going to kill him. And after we kill him, we're going to kill Lazarus too. And once both of those, are, those people are dead, then maybe we can be done with this Christian movement. Maybe we can be done with this thing and we can move on with our lives. You see. But they couldn't do it during the actual Passover festival because Jesus had fans. Jesus had fans. And these fans were expecting Jesus's arrival. They, they, they had heard rumors. There was a buzz that Jesus was coming. In fact, in John 12, 12, it says this, the great crowd that had come for the festival, so all these people had come for the festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So the whole city was expecting Jesus. And the reason that they were excited was because they said they, they thought, well, maybe this will be the Passover that not only do we celebrate the, uh, how Israel... Uh, came out of Egypt, but maybe this will also be the Passover where Jesus will proclaim himself as king and we will also come out from under Roman occupation. They were excited for that. They were excited. They wanted Jesus to come and be king and overthrow the government. It was all political. And let me tell you something, it was full of patriots, full of patriots. So Rome was nervous. Pilate was nervous. The Pharisees were nervous. Everybody is looking for Jesus. Everybody was looking for him. And they saw him. They saw him from a distance. And when they saw him from the distance, people began to run to him and throw down palm branches on the path as he was coming in on a donkey. And as they were doing that, they were saying, Hosanna. Remember that? John chapter 12. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Now listen, the, the, uh, uh, people, some people were already nervous about that. The Pharisees were nervous about it. People were nervous. Rome was nervous. Pilate was nervous. Uh, but, but, and so the, here he comes in and they say, listen, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then they escalate it and they say this, Hosanna, blessed who comes, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. See that? See how now Jesus is a, is a political threat? Blessed is the king of Israel. They had assumed that Jesus had come to Jerusalem to do something for their nation. But in fact, Jesus had come to Jerusalem to do something for you. They thought Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to do something for their nation. But in fact, Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to do something for you. In the next few days, he would do something for the entire world that would confuse his disciples. And so because people were after Jesus and Jesus knew it, for the next few days, Jesus was laying low. He would go here and there. He would go in the temple and teach a little bit, and there'd be Jesus sightings. They'd get reports. Jesus is here. Jesus is there. But the problem is, is when they get there, then he's gone. And by the time they get to the other place, that there was another Jesus sighting, they'd get there, but he'd be gone. And so they weren't sure what to do. The Pharisees and the Sadducees seemed like it wasn't going to work, seemed like this was going to fail. But then finally something happened. Finally, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they got a break because one of Jesus' closest followers would break rank. Look at this in Luke chapter 22. And Judas, who was a disciple of Jesus, went to the chief priests and the officers. Oh, I just closed the ring, y'all. Look at that. Hey. Okay, anyway, um, <laughs> it says that, Jesus, that Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. And look what Luke goes on to say this, that they were delighted and agreed to give him money. See, the reason they were delighted was because they were afraid. They were afraid that if Jesus became king, that if Jesus declared himself Messiah, that Jesus would come and set up a new type of government. And because of that, they were scared that they would lose everything. That Jesus becoming king means that they would lose everything that they held valuable to them. Everything that was meaningful to them. Everything that, that gave them identity and worth. And perhaps that's the reason you're afraid for Jesus to become king of your life because you're afraid that maybe he'll take away something that you have tethered your identity to yeah. something that if that 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 you think that your value and your worth are defined by and so the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they agreed with Judas. They made this plan. Look at this, Luke twenty two six. He says, and he consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when there was no crowd present. Now, it was Jesus's intention all along to give up his life. That was Jesus that he already had that in the plan. But there were some things that Jesus needed to take care of, some loose ends that Jesus needed to take care of before he did that. And, and, and getting around and having a meal, the Passover meal, was the perfect opportunity for him to do that. And so what he did was he sent some friends out to find a place, to find a space that they could be able to have this meal together, someplace off the beaten path, someplace where nobody would find them, someplace where they could not get arrested. And they did. And they found this upper room. And while they were having this Passover meal, a meal that they have had Hundreds of times. I mean, you're talking about the, 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 the people of God have eaten Passover meals for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And here they are having this meal. But something very different happened. Something that was very disruptive. Something that was completely messed them up forever. It was a messy meal. Here's what happened. Matthew 26, 26. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. 
Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says, this, Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Given for you. Now you can imagine, here they are, and, and they're about to eat, and, and they're about to take a bite of this bread. And you can imagine that just as they were about to take a bite, they all froze because of what Jesus just said. I'm sure they all said, wait, wait, wait a minute, Jesus. What, what did you just say? What did you just say? That this bread represents your body? What are you talking about? And, and, and then Jesus makes it even more offensive. Look at what he says. He says, this is my body given for you, Luke 22. Do this in remembrance of. Now, they could have stopped him right there. To which they could have said, wait a minute, Jesus, you don't have to tell me what to do this in remembrance of. We've been doing this in remembrance of the same thing since we were kids. And, since, and our parents did it since they were kids. And our grandparents did it since they were kids. And our, gra- and our great-grandparents did it since they were kids. And our great-great-great-grandparents and our great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. We know what this is in remembrance of. We, we know that this is in remembrance of God uh, coming and taking our people out of Egypt. And, and punishing the nation of Egypt. And punishing Pharaoh. And, and, and taking the land. And, and, and breaking its body. And, and we know exactly what this is in remembrance of. And Jesus is like, I'm changing all of that. Because from now on, when you celebrate Passover, look what he says. He says this, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Me. Now, at that point, everybody probably should have left the room. At that point, everybody probably should have been offended and left the room. Because, because here is Jesus doing something, and, he's, and he is replacing himself with Passover. And they're, I'm sure they're thinking, what do you do? You can't do that, G. You can't just replace yourself with Passover, right? Let me give you an illustration. Let's just say I were to come up here, and I would say, hey, guys, from now on Christmas, everything we do for Christmas is now about me. It's about Roger. So we're going to have a Roger Eve service. We're going we're, we're, we're to have hymns about me, and, 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 and it's all going to be about me. And, and when you think of the manger, you're going to have my name, my face there. And, and it's, all about, it's all about me. I, you know, it's now about, from this point forward, Inspire Church, Christmas is all about Roger. Now, you laugh because that sounds absolutely insane. And if I were being serious, you'd have every right to walk out. Because I can't replace myself with Christmas. Are you kidding me? Well, let me just say this. What Jesus was doing was far crazier than that. Crazier than that. Was more disruptive than that. It was a messy meal. Who knows what's running through their minds at that moment? Who knows what happened? But they ate the meal trying to, in their mind, I'm sure, connect the dots and put the pieces all together. And I'm sure in their mind, they're probably thinking, oh, he, you know, he's, he, maybe he's not making sense or, or I'm sure he knows what he's talking about. We, we're just got to figure it out. Wow. What is this meal that they're eating? I'm sure they thought about that. I'm sure they thought about what is this thing that we are partaking in? Because what you need to know, Jesus, is there's a history to this. There's a chronology to this, and there is. And you need to know that when you come up and you grab the cracker and you grab the juice, there's a chronology to this messy meal. Number two, the chronology. Now, this second portion has been heavily influenced by a pastor named Ryan Ashley, who actually did, he, I listened to a podcast on this teaching, and it was incredible that as he was going through it, there were some things that I had, had been brought to, back to memory, and there were some new concepts that I was able to really sort of wrestle with. And, and so for me, um, it really was something that as I was listening, I was able to grasp some concepts of this messy meal, this communion that I hadn't thought about before. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. 
Now, when he says do this, this, what is this? That word this doesn't just mean the cracker and the juice. He doesn't mean just do this, it remembers to me, but he means do this. What? Have communion with each other. To be around the table, to be in community with, follow, with other followers of Jesus where Jesus is right at the center. Do that. Live life around the table. Do this. This is living life around the table. In remembrance. The qualifier remembrance doesn't just mean uh, to, to bring back into memory. But actually it means to be actualized in the awareness of who Jesus is. So when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he's not just saying, remember me. But what he's saying is, actualize your awareness of me. Actualize your awareness of me. Because remember, what communion is, is it's taking time and it's sort of meshing it all together. It's interlacing it all together, right? Because when we take communion, we look past on what Jesus did, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. We're looking back to all of that and we're looking at the cross and we're looking at Calvary and we're looking at the blood that was spilled. But we're also taking it into the present and we're being very introspective, right? We're, we're, we're taking inventory of our hearts and, and, and we're asking the tough questions and we're looking out at other people and, and we're asking the tough questions. But then we're also looking at the future. The future of Jesus Christ is going to come back for his bride, for his church. In fact, the Bible all over talks about how the future of G being with Jesus is going to be us sitting around what is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and, and we're going to be around a table living life together. Yeah. Look what theologian N.T. Wright says. He says, the hardest thing about the sacraments, which is what this is, is that, it, uh, of that sacrament, is that they invite us to look at time in a very different way. The term memorial does not merely mean to bring something to mind or remembering. It refers in some way to bringing the past story and divine action of the past into the present such that the present audience becomes part of the story and receives the benefits of such activation, of such act actualization. You see that? What it means is this. Last year, um, Olivia uh, played softball, and this year, I think Olivia and Adeline are going to sign up for softball. But you know, when your kids are playing softball, the coach is teaching, would you know, teach her what to do, and and she would practice, and 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 and, and we'd show her trips, uh, little little uh, tricks and little tips, and the coach would show her, you know, kind of what to do and, and the proper way to swing and the proper way to throw and all of this stuff, right? And and show her all of these things, so that way on game day. She will remember what was taught, but not just remember it, but bring it into actual awareness. You see what I'm saying? Actualize it and do it for what? For a home run, for something to happen in the future. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so what's happening is she's bringing in the past and she's bringing in the, the future and she's bringing it into her present in such a way that it is shaping what is currently going on. And when we have communion, when we're part of this messy meal, it's done in such a way that the past and the future break into your present and shape the trajectory of your life. Wow. Now, the meal that we are about to partake in, the practice that we're going to do in just a few moments, there is a history of that. And there have been different names that have been used, and each name sort of brings about a different aspect of the table that we are to have bring to our memory, but to actualize as well. And so we're just going to go through them. I'm only going to do five quickly. Number one is communion. Communion, the name communion. Now, all over the Bible, this name, or koinonia in Greek, which is where we get the name communion, is found all over the Bible. It means community, it means sharing, it means participating in, and the New Testament will use it in all of those variations. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look what he says. He says, is it not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation, 
that word koinonia, community, communion, sharing. You could put all of those words there and it would all mean the same. In the blood of Christ. And is it not the bread that we break a koinonia, a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body for we all share the one loaf. So we actualize that we are to commune. That's the point of communion, to commune, to have community with. With who? Well, first and foremost, with Jesus. That you are, during communion, to attune your attention to Jesus Christ. But also, that we are also to commune with each other. That we are to commune with each other. Number two, second name that was used is the breaking of bread. This is all over the New Testament, and this is actually Luke's favorite term or name for this practice. And what's amazing is what are we supposed to remember about breaking bread is that bread is what gives life. In fact, Jesus Christ says that he is the bread of life. And what it does is it reminds us that we are dependent on Jesus, that all life comes from Jesus, that we do not possess the attribute of aseity like God has, meaning aseity means that he is fully and completely self-reliant and self-dependent. He does not depend on anything or anyone else. He is self Reliant, self-sustaining. We, he is that we are not. It is a constant reminder that all life comes from him, that we are dependent on Jesus. We're dependent on Jesus. And in our Western individualistic culture, that's hard for us to wrestle with. It's hard for us to admit Number three, the third name is the Eucharist, the Eucharist, which from the Greek means Thanksgiving. In other words, this was called the Thanksgiving meal, Thanksgiving meal. And we ain't talking about like the turkey and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and the gravy and the ham and the, I don't know what all you have. I mean, I'm sounding really white right now, I know, but <laughs> just say, you know, the macaroni and cheese, all that stuff, but you know. <laughs> so this, this Thanksgiving meal had lamb. Praise God. So if any of y'all ever have lamb in your Thanksgiving, you're probably closer to Jesus. Just kidding. <laughs> the Thanksgiving meal. I need to stop laughing at myself because I will just, I will do that. Um, and what's interesting is you find, it, you find it all over the New Testament, but it wasn't, it wasn't just popular in the New Testament. This actually phrase caught on during the first century church and beyond when the gospel went into the Latin world and then to the German world and then to the English world. So Eucharist has been around and been used in a lot of cultures. And what we're supposed to actualize, what we're supposed to remember, bring into memory, and then actualize from that is that we have to realize that everything from God is a gift. This is why we're thankful. This is why we have a, a posture of gratitude that nothing is earned. Nothing is deserved. That, 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 that there, there isn't anything that God gives us that was earned or deserved. Anything at all. It's not like you could become holy enough to deserve him. It's not like you could do enough good things to deserve him. It's not like you could become righteous enough to deserve him or attend enough church services or pray enough prayers or, or give enough money or do enough good deeds or serve on enough teams. or You couldn't do any of that to deserve God's love because his love is an unconditional, unmerited gift. So when we yes. eat the cracker and we drink the juice, it's to remember that we are grateful because he's given us a gift that we have not earned, that we cannot earn. Yes. Number four, the agape feast, the agape feast. Now, for those who have been in church long enough, you automatically will know that that word agape means love. And so this word was called the love feast. Now, I know that sounds very 1970s San Francisco kind of, you know, language, right? But that's what it was called. And, and in fact, uh, it's, there, there's only one place that this name is mentioned, and it's in the very popular book of Jude that I know all of you guys know by heart because you love that book. When you go to sit down and read the Bible, you say, I'm going to go read the book of Jude. 
It's found one place in the book of Jude. But what's interesting is that it was actually used a ton, a ton by early church leaders, by early church fathers. In fact, after the Eucharist, it was the second most popular use for the word communion, the love feast. And this is to remember or to actualize that this is a feast. It's a celebration. In fact, if you were part of the first century church and you went to communion, what you would walk in on is a party. What you would walk in on is a feast. What you would enter in is a celebration. Now, we do this all the time with stuff that we want to celebrate. We will use meals to celebrate, right? Christmas dinner, Easter dinners, you know, weddings, uh, birthdays, things we want to celebrate. It's all about the meals, right? And it wasn't until really the medieval times where communion became more individual and introspective But before that, it was a celebration feast. And you might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about about the fact of, you know, what Paul says, examining yourself? Doesn't Paul instruct us to do that, that we should examine ourselves? Yes, he does, and he takes it very seriously, and so should we. Now, for us, what we mean when we say that is, from your seat to this table, that from that, as you're walking here, that you are to examine yourself. But what Paul says, Paul's instruction is, hey, before you get to the table, before you come to the feast, before you show up, examine yourself and and, and do what you need to do to correct yourself. If there is something that you are harboring, some unforgiveness with somebody, go and make sure that that's right. So that's what they would do because a lot of times communion would would happen, these feasts would happen Sunday nights. So what happened is on Saturdays or or throughout the week because they knew communion was coming up is if there was a problem, they would go to their brother or their sister and they would make amends. If there was something they needed to repent for, they would repent. They would do all of that before coming to the table. They would do the hard work of reconciliation and introspection and and, and asking the hard questions. They would do all of that before coming to the table. Not because you have to be perfect. Because you might be thinking, well, listen, if that's the case, if I have to be perfect, then then I'm never going to be able to do it. And you're absolutely right. All of us would not be able to do it. But when Paul talks about coming to the table in an unworthy manner, what most scholars will say is this, to to bring worth to the table, to honor the table, not to manipulate it or treat treat it cavalier, but to honor it, not not to just take it in an unworthy manner. There's gravity to it. There's seriousness to it. In other words, if if you're going and you're having sex before marriage and that's your lifestyle, and then you just come to the table and you eat the cracker and you drink the, and you drink the cup? What are you doing? If you have this constant anger and hate towards somebody and they're your brother and they're your sister in Christ and you just want to push it under the rug and you don't want to say hi to them, you're not going to shake their hand or fist bump them on a Sunday morning. No, forget it. You're just going to talk about them behind their back. But then you want to come and you want to take the cracker and drink the juice. What are you doing? So there is, there's a weight to it. There's a heaviness to it. Well, I like how Pastor Roger does this, and Pastor Roger said that. Pastor Roger, blah, blah, blah. Just come to me. What are you, what are you doing? Right? <laughs> so there's a seriousness to it. And yet, and yet at the same time, there's a joyous celebration. It's a celebration because you are now free and free indeed. Yes, it's a celebration. Best-selling Christian author, Philip Yancey, says this, the table is different. It's different. It isn't where sinners find Christ, but where sons and daughters celebrate being found. Maybe someday, instead of solemnly making our way to the tables, we should dance for joy. Maybe we should sing every born-again song we know. Maybe we should tell our homecoming stories and laugh like people who have no longer fear death. Maybe we should ask if anyone wants seconds and hold our little cups high to toast lost sinners found and dead brothers and sisters coming alive. It's a celebration, you see. It's a joyous time. It's both and, not either or, you see. It's two sides of the same coin. And finally, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. The girls will laugh at me because sometimes I'll say supper instead of dinner. 
Um, and, you know, it's just how I was raised. My dad's side was from Connecticut, and my mom's side was from the South. So sometimes I say dinner, sometimes I say supper. And the 9 o'clock service, I told him, I just want to eat both. <laughs> so... <laughs> You see this term a lot, but especially in 1 Corinthians 11. And 1 Corinthians 11 is really the, the most in-depth teaching on this practice. And the context that, that, that Paul was talking about when he calls it the Lord's Supper is because in Rome, in Rome, the whole cities would come together for what they would call supper. But it, but it was very, uh, it, it was very uh, set apart based on class, really, because what would happen is the rich would be able to get off early, they would come, and they would eat all this great food. But the slaves and the servants, they had to work longer, and so they would come in later, and they would get whatever was left over if there was anything left over. And, and so what was happening was the Christians were doing the same thing. The wealthy Christians would come in, and they'd eat all this food during this Passover meal, and, and then the slaves and the servants that were in the society but that were Christian would come, and they'd have to come in later because they were still working, and they'd come, and there'd be hardly anything left if there was anything left. And Paul said, what are you doing? See, the, the, the table brings justice. Justice. And says, this is for everybody. This is for everybody. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. It really was this idea of coming together and celebration of a covenant. That was really the backstory of this meal. The backstory of this weird meal was that it was a covenantal meal. What do you mean by that? Number three, the covenant. So here they are. They're in the upper room. They've eaten and after they're done eating, now Jesus takes the cup. Look what he says in Luke 22. It says, and he took bread and uh, bread, gave things and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant. Is a new covenant. This cup is a new covenant. Now, they could have stopped him right there, and they could have said, wait, 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 we know what the cup is. We, we, we remember we've been doing this for a long time. We know that the cup represents the blood of all the lambs that have been shed throughout all of these years, all hundreds and hundreds of years, and it goes all the way back to Passover, the lamb that, that, that was sacrificed and the blood of that lamb that was put on the doorpost back in Egypt. And, and, and ever since then, lamb after lambs after lambs and animals after animals and bulls and goats and pigeons and all of this animal blood, we know that when we drink the cup, it represents all of that. You don't have to tell us that, Jesus. We know, we know, we know what it is. And, and, and so I'm sure they're nervous because they already know what Jesus said about the bread. And I'm sure they're like, please don't change this 1,500-year-old script. Can we just stick to the script that this juice is about those lambs? Wow. And Jesus said, nope. Look what he says, Luke 22, 20. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Wow. <laughs> At this point, they're like, okay which is poured out for you. I want you to understand how extraordinarily disruptive this meal was. This was a messy meal. And since then, Passover meal in Christianity has never been the same. Has never been the same. Wow. And now Jesus is establishing a new covenant. A new covenant. Now they should have seen this coming. They should have seen this coming because 650 years before that moment, Jesus, before the moment that Jesus is there in this room with his disciples saying these things, 650 years before that, there was a prophet named Jeremiah, and this is what he said. Jeremiah 31, he said this, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. And so the question that begs to be asked is, well, if this is a new covenant, what does this new covenant look like? And Jeremiah answered that. He said, he said that he answered it by saying that the law is now going to be written on their hearts and, 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 and written in their minds. In other words, this is now going to be something that is of the conscious. This is now going to be something uh, that, is due, that is based on relationship with God. You see? Relationship with God. This is the new covenant. 
This is the new covenant that Jesus says, I am inaugurating. I am unleashing I am unleashing tonight. He says, I am establishing that new covenant, the one you should have been waiting for. That's what he's telling them. That's what he's telling them. And so what that means is every time we come to the table, it is almost like what we are doing is we are renewing our vows in this covenant ceremony. Every time we come, it's just like when you renew your vows in marriage, right? You know, 50 years, 25 years, some people two years, whatever. But point is, you know, we, we forget pretty easily, right? So some of us, we might need every six months. I don't know. But <laughs> and for us, we especially forget what the Lord has done. So here at Inspire, we have to do this thing every month because you'll forget. Guaranteed by next week, you'll forget what the Lord has done. And so it is, a, it is a covenant renewal ceremony. Look what scholar John Hicks says. He says this, when we eat and drink communion, we renew our covenant with God. We pledge ourselves to keep the covenant. It is a moment of rededication and recommitment. The supper is the ritual moment when we renew the covenant vows. I love it. Pastor Timothy Keller says this, that it is a renewal of vows ceremony. That's what this is. See, and in the Old Testament, uh, when the, w- there's a word covenant, and, and we don't really use that. We use contract, but contract is very different than covenant. But they would have covenants. And in the Old Testament, how they would sort of uh, seal a covenant is they would take an animal, maybe more if they were wealthy, and they would cut the animal in half, and they would lay its parts, one on this side, one on this side. Then the two people, the two parties that were coming into covenant, they would walk through the halves. And while they were walking through, what they would say is, if I don't keep my part of the covenant, let what happened to this animal happen to me. That's what they'd say. If I don't keep my end of the deal, my end of the bargain, then what happened to these animals, let it happen to me. Well, what we read in Genesis is that Abraham experienced something really weird. God is coming to Abraham and he's making this covenant. And then the Bible says that God told him to go and get a bunch of animals, cut them in half and lay them, and lay them one on this side, one on this side. And he does. Now to us, it's weird. To, to Abraham, he knows exactly what's going on. And the Bible says that Abraham's fighting off the crows and everything, trying, trying to figure out, well, what is God wanting me to do? And he's just staring at this stuff for hours and hours until the sun goes down. And then Abraham falls into a dark sleep, and Abraham has this experience where all of a sudden Abraham sees um, a smoking pot. Now, for you guys, what that really means is a cauldron, just to clarify, with smoke coming out of it, all right? Because, you know, smoking pot. And a torch that is on fire. And what, and what, and what he saw was this smoking cauldron... And this torch that was on fire moving through the parts of the animal. That's what he saw. Now, as fascinating as it is, the strangest part, that's a strange thing to experience. But here's the strangest part of that whole thing. God never asked Abraham to walk through the parts as well. What does that mean? What it means is this, is God is saying, listen, my covenant is that I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. That's the covenant. And God says, here's what's going to happen. We're going to splice these animals open. I'm going to walk through them and I'm going to be your God. And if I am never your God, then, then, then let what happened with these animals happen to me. If I ever stop being your God, then let what happened to these animals happen to me. And then what should have happened was Abraham should have walked through it and said, okay, and I am your people. And if we ever stop being your people, let what happens to these animals happen to us. And God says, no. God says, I'll walk through it by myself. And if you fail to keep your end, then let what happens to these animals happen to me. Do you see what God did? And it did happen on a hill called Golgotha where the Canaan king hung on the cross of Calvary. You see that? You see? And so, and so this is the covenant. The covenant is, is this, is that, is that he, God is on the giving side and you're on the receiving side. In other words, what, what God is saying and what Jesus is saying to them and what he says to us now is that this is for you and it's on me. That's what Jesus is saying. It's for you, but it's on me. It's 100% for you, but it's 100% on me. And they should have saw that coming. They shouldn't have been surprised to hear Jesus talk that way. Because even John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was out in the river baptizing, one day he looks and he's talking, he's telling everybody how Jesus is going to come. And look what he says in John 1.29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God. 
Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look, the lamb, the lamb, the Passover lamb, the one that will take the place of every lamb that ever came before. And from that point, we'll never need another lamb because he will be all sufficient. He will suffice, you see. The lamb, look at the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb of God who will single-handedly all by himself He's going to take it all on him, the sins of the entire world. And that night he was captured. And the next day, this covenant, this new covenant, would officially be ratified with Roman nails in a Roman city on a Roman cross. This unconditional unmerited covenant this covenant you see where all of a sudden rules all these the old customer old covenant was filled with rules you say well what's this new covenant what's the rules for the new covenant only two to love God and to love others you see you say well how, how do we become part of that covenant how do I become a part of that covenant? Well, if you were to ask John, the disciple of Jesus, John, the one who watched Jesus die, John, the one who put his arm around Jesus' mother and cared for her, John, John, the one who peered in and saw an empty tomb, that John, John, who ate breakfast with a resurrected Christ. Can you imagine? Here Jesus rose from the dead, and here he is in his resurrected body and sees you out in the ocean and says, come over here, I have some fish, we're gonna make a fire, we're gonna have some breakfast. That John, if you were to ask that John, how do I get into this covenant? He'd probably go back to John 3, 16, where Jesus said, listen, if anybody, whosoever, anybody, whosoever believes in me, they won't perish, but they'll have everlasting life. Peter, Peter, how, how do we get in this covenant, Peter? How do we get in the covenant that you're talking about, that you're living in? Peter, how do we get there? And I'm sure Peter would have brought you back to the very first time he ever met Jesus. And, and Jesus is telling him how to fish. And Peter's probably like, what are you talking about? I'm a professional fisherman. What are you talking about? And a miracle happened. And in that time, Peter knew right in there in that moment that this guy was a different category. And Peter falls down and says, I'm unworthy. Get away from me. Don't even talk to me. Don't even stand near me. I'm unworthy to be in your presence. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, follow me. See, how do we get into this covenant? Peter would probably say, well, follow him. Follow me. My friend, that's the invitation. That's the invitation to this covenant is to follow him with one caveat. One caveat, which is this. Jesus says there's one caveat. I will know everything about you. That's the caveat. I know everything about you, and I still want you to follow me. I know everything about you, and I still want to love you, and I still want to show you favor, and I still want to save you, and I still want to give you grace, and I still, I know everything about you. I know what you did. I know what you didn't do. I know what you promised to do, and you didn't do it. I know all about you. I know your fears, and I want you to follow me. I know your doubts, and I want you to follow me. I know your insecurities, and I want you to follow me. I know I know everything you're going to face, every storm, every trial, every heartache, every season of depression, every moment of loneliness. I know it all. Every time you're going to get angry, every time you'll feel frustrated, every time you fail, you can't even hold up your rules, much less my rules, but I still want you to follow me. He says, because I, will see, I see you truly. I see you truly. And I love you fully. I see you truly, and I love you fully. It's this covenant. When we come to the table, when we eat of the table, it's all of these things that we've discussed all coming together for us not just to remember, but to actualize. But to actualize. And how you do it is by making him your firm foundation. 
by making him the rock on which you build your life. As you stand to your feet and we get ready to respond. There was a school that I, we, or a song that we learned in Sunday school and maybe for those of you who've been around long enough, you might know it, but where all of the kids would sing this song and they'd sing, um, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods went up. The rain came down and the floods went up. The rain came down and the floods went up. But the house on the rock stood firm. See, because you're going to need that kind of foundation. Because let me tell you, the wind is going to blow, my friend. Storms are going to come. And you're going to need something that when it's all over can keep you secure. And that is this covenant. Not a covenant that asks you to perform. Not a covenant that demands for you to try to be something that you cannot be but a covenant that simply says, come and follow me. And God says, it's all on me, but it's all for you. It's all on me, but it's all for you. We're gonna get ready to take communion right now. and um, I'm gonna ask my host to go ahead and, and get ready. And I just wonder if maybe we can take a moment to just think about this practice that we're about to do, that some of us are about to grab a cracker and grab a juice. And I just wonder, you know, if we're doing it, remembering that it's this communion, meaning that we are communing with the very presence of Jesus Christ, that we are taking our attention and putting it on him, that, that when we feel the cracker and the breaking of the bread, that it's reminding us that, that, that we are totally dependent and reliant on Jesus Christ, that this is a, a moment of thanksgiving where we are thankful because everything from God is a gift. We haven't deserved or earned any of it, that this is a love feast, a celebration, the fact that we are free and free indeed, and that you have brothers and sisters that are free in Jesus Christ, that this is the Lord's Supper, where everybody that comes to the table is all on the same playing field. There isn't classism. There isn't any of that because all of it, we come together the same here for the Lord's Supper to celebrate a covenant and to have a covenant renewal, to remind ourselves of the covenant that Jesus Christ made with us, not because we have been completely faithful, but because he has. Can we just do that right now? Take inventory of your heart. Is there any place that you need to bring forgiveness? Is there any place or space in your heart that you haven't let God be totally king because you're afraid of what he might take? And you have tethered that thing so much thinking, well, I need that to be happy or I need that to know who I am. Is there any sin that we need to confess and repent over? Can we just do that now? going to dismiss you to come um, and we have a table here in the front we have a table there in the back and let me just say this you do not have to be a member of inspire to partake you do have to be a member of the body of christ and so if you have accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior we invite you to the table if you have not accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior there's two things really i want you to hear number one is we invite you to observe we invite you to observe this moment in this practice. But secondly, I want to say this, there's always room at the table for one more. There's always room at the table for one more. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like this, understanding the gospel. And the gospel is simply this, 
that I am a sinner. You are a sinner. We are sinners. And for you to recognize that I am a sinner and that I cannot save myself. I can't, I break my own rules, my own standards of what I think right and wrong is. There's no way I can do that. And that I need a savior. And you look at Jesus Christ and you recognize that he died on the cross for your sins. You recognize that that should have been you and he took your place. And because of that, you give your life to him. You say, you are gonna be my Lord. I am going to follow you. And because of that, then he clothes you in his righteousness, not a righteousness that you deserved or own, but, but one that, that, that he gives to you. And you then are in a place, in a space where now you are saying, I am going to rely on Jesus. I'm gonna confess my sins. I'm gonna confess that I need a savior. I'm gonna believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. And the gospel says that then you stand as one that is righteous or right before God, but not because you stand before him on your own, but because now Jesus stands in your place. He stands in your place. And you can make that decision right now in your heart where you're at. In Jesus' name. Let us come to the table. Paul says, for what I've received from the Lord, I now offer or deliver to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do that now. also took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes so friends let's lift our cup up in celebration that we are free in Jesus name that we are free and free indeed because of Jesus Christ. And we have hope knowing that he is going to come again and make all things right. In Jesus' name, let's drink. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, that you'll be with us today. In Jesus' name.
And can we respond in praise today? Respond in thanksgiving. Let's worship him. as a community of confessors, God, knowing and believing in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.